So I just wanted to start off by asking us a question. Is it, is it me or has like life ratcheted up a notch? Like, wow, like, or 10. Or like, isn't everybody you know going through some kind of uncertainty? You know, some kind of uncertainty going on or just feeling lost? I think that the universe is saying the grace period is now over. I really think that's what's going on. I think we have this intelligence in us. We have dreams inside us. We have love inside us. We have gifts to give this world. We have a connection. We know we have this connection. And you know, we've been studying, and I think this is the time in the world where we are meant to give what we have to give, where we are the answers, where there's uncertainty in the world, but I think there's a certainty in us. I think that there's a path in you, even when you're uncertain, that moment by moment, we know what to do when we listen. So I'm going to ask you, what stops us from listening to our inner voice? What stops us from listening to that path? Because here's one thing I know. If you're not listening to yourself, you're listening to somebody else. Right? You know? So who are you listening to? Are you listening to the voice of the media? the voice of education, the voice of a family member, the voice of your mother, maybe, that was mine. I listened to my mother. Um, it's because when I was young, I knew what I wanted to do. When I was young, I wanted to write. I took creative writing in high school, and the creative writing teacher was gorgeous. So this was a sign, you know? Like, <laughs> Hey, this could work out, right? And so I went home to share this fabulous news with my family that I'd found my calling. But I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, to an Orthodox Jewish family. And if you came home to said, I found my calling, I want to be a writer, nobody said Mazel Tov. Nobody, okay, nobody. If that, you know, uh, of just uh, my mother basically, you know, I, I could have said, I found my calling. I want to start a meth lab. It would have been the same thing. It would have been the same thing in my family, you know? Selling drugs, selling your body to the night, being creative. They're all the same people. You know, my mother's idea, they're all going to live under the same bridge, you know? And so my mother said something like, You're going to write? You're going to write? You are going to starve. You're going to write. <laughs> and that was the go for your dreams talk that I got, you know? And then she, being a reasonable woman, said something like, what, you can't get a job? And you'll write on the Sundays, right? The reasonable plan. And most of us got this reasonable plan, didn't we? Most of us got the same practical advice, maybe different accent, but same practical advice <laughs> of stay safe, don't do what you love. Don't do what moves you. Don't do what rocks your world. Uh, stay safe. Stay, stay practical. Deny your spirit, right? And so how could that ever be safe? You know, like, I've been running around the country talking to people because I want you to know that what you think of as the safe path isn't what's safe. It's never safe to deny our spirit or our soul uh, or what's speaking to us, right? But I didn't know that back then, and I went off to law school. And I got accepted to Harvard Law School, and I graduated with honors from Harvard Law School, and I was, yeah, big deal. And uh, I practiced, and my mother was very, very proud. She was bragging in every synagogue for all she was worth. <laughs> You know, she was just like, oh, my little girl, I don't want to tell you. <gasps> Let me tell you. <laughs> and so I was practicing law in a major law firm. And some of you may have had this feeling where your life looks right. It seems right. You're doing the right thing. It looks right. But it doesn't feel right. Like something feels wrong or it feels empty or feels like not enough. And that sometimes is spirit speaking to us, right? When, when it feels empty. And thank God a friend of mine said something amazing to me at the time, because I was struggling, because it looked right and I was dying inside. And he said, you know, think about it. If you've been this successful doing something you don't love, <laughs> what could you do with what you love? And that woke me up. I wanted to know where this life would take me if I listened to love. I wanted to know what, where my life would go if I only listened to my love and not my fear, 
right? So I walked out of my legal career, and I didn't have a plan, and I didn't have, a, I didn't have money. Everybody always thinks, oh, well, you must have had money. You were, you, know, you were a lawyer. But, you know, like if you're miserable, you're drinking, you're a therapist. I mean, it's expensive to be unhappy. It's really expensive. You need a bank account to be unhappy. Right? You know, just saying. Like, you know, that, that's costly, you know? <laughs> so, anyways, um, my b new book is called Thriving Through Uncertainty. And uh, if, you're, uh, if you walk out of everything without a plan and without money, you are now an expert on thriving through uncertainty, right? <laughs> so, um, I'm a coach and I work with a lot of artists, and entrepreneurs, and visionaries, and leaders, and anybody who'll pay me. Um, and I always get asked the same question of like, Tam, I get it, I wanna do my dream, I wanna do what I'm supposed to do, I wanna do my mission, I wanna follow what I'm here for, but I don't know how. I don't know what steps to take. I don't know how to get from A to B to C to D. I don't know how. And what I want you to know is that you can't plan an inspired life. You can't plan an inspired life. Your limited mind will never see the way. So if you're dealing with an illness or a relationship or something in your life or career, whatever it is, and you're trying to figure it out and figure it out and figure it out, you can't plan an inspired life. But what we can do is receive it moment by moment. Like in this moment, there might be something, right? So I'll give you an example. When I first left law, um, I wrote my first book. I was writing my first book, and it took me 12 years to write my first book. Um, and I know some people are impressed by that, and some people are now thinking, oh, I don't have that kind of time. I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go to that workshop then, forget it. <laughs> you know, it took her 12 years, I'm not going. Um, but I, I always tell people, I think it took me 11 years to heal and one year to write a book, right? Because if you're on a spiritual path, it took me 11 years to believe and to trust and to undo negative beliefs and negative stories and negative junk, right? And to believe that there's a loving God and a loving universe and that I actually am safe. It took me 11 years to trust that and one year to write a book, right? So I want you to keep in mind if, you're, if your life hasn't taken off the way you think you want it to or feels like it's taking too long or you're not where you think you should be, on a spiritual path, we're doing so much more. It's so much bigger than a linear path because we're undoing beliefs, right? So anyways, when I finally finished writing this book at the end of 12 years, I, you know, I didn't have a contract, I didn't have an agent, I didn't have a publisher, I was just following this inner voice, right? And then I thought, well, what do I do now? Like, how do you get it published? I don't know, you know? And so I read all kinds of books about self-publishing and commercial publishing. And I was in a meditation and I was just asking, what do I do, what do I do? And I kept hearing this inner voice and it just kept saying, just put it in the river. Just put it in the river. Isn't that pretty? What does that mean? <laughs> Come on. Come on. Like you have to play games, like figuring out what your inner voice is saying now. Like, oh, come on, you know? It's a, I live in Denver, there are no rivers to speak of. And I was certainly hoping that my inner voice was in saying, yeah, dump your manuscript in, a, you know, in the river, you know, like get rid of it, you know? Um, um, I, I tell this story often at different readings and different readers have suggested that maybe the voice meant put it on Amazon, you know? And, <laughs> Okay, okay. But I knew intuitively it meant, it meant to self-publish the book because I knew intuitively it meant just get that work in the stream of life any way, any how you can. Just put it in the stream of life. If it's supposed to go somewhere, it will, right? So I kind of knew that that meant self-publishing, which was not the answer I wanted, um, because it's like, oh great, now I have to put my own money into it. I don't know anything about distribution. I don't know anything about marketing, uh, you know, but that's, that's the advice I was getting. And so I finally decided, you know, I'd followed this inner voice and I'm on this path. I, f I f felt like, okay, I'm gonna follow it. I'm gonna go all the way with it. I'm gonna trust this inner voice. The second that you decide to do that, the second you decide you are going to trust your heart more than anything else, that you are gonna trust your knowing more than anything else, the second you decide you are gonna follow this, you are going to meet the most judgmental person. <laughs> They are waiting for you. 
they are waiting for you, right? I don't know why. Um, I went to an ex-boyfriend's house to a Passover dinner, and I sat down next to this woman, and she was my mother on steroids. <laughs> And she's drinking bad wine all night. So now she's in a mood and she starts grilling me all night. Like, so you're gonna publish a book and you know nothing about marketing and you know nothing about distribution and you're putting your own money into this. You're very ambitious, right? Which is code for you're a nut. You know, step away from my kids, right? And I'd, I'd never gotten the meaning of Passover. I don't know if you know the Jewish tradition of Passover is all about the exodus of the Jews. It's about the exodus of the Jews. I never understood that service. I got it that night. Like, I understood it for the first time. It was like, oh my God, let my people go. Let my people go, you know? I, I was getting the idea of Exodus, you know? Because I'm thinking, what do I tell this woman? Do I tell her, oh, don't worry, I have a plan. I'm going to put it in a river. <laughs> you know, don't worry, don't worry. I've been listening to an inner voice for 12 years. It's very nice, right? And you know, because you can say stuff like in a room like this and we all approve of each other of it, right? You know, but uh, uh, again, you talk to somebody normal, like not some, <laughs> don't be trying that on, on our normal people, okay? You know, I am dying to know how he's doing my Jewish mother's accent, by the way. But anyway, I'm just like, I'm like totally, totally dying to know that. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting for this. <laughs> <laughs> but I digress. Um, <laughs> um, so, but I walked out of that meeting and I finally thought, you know what, I'm going to do it. And I finally self-published my first book. Um, it was called This Time I Dance, Creating the Work You Love. And I, I self-published it. And it started spreading through word of mouth. It hit the Denver Post bestseller list. It hit the business bestseller list. And then four months um, after I'd self-published it, I got an email that came out of the blue that literally said, your fairy godmother has arrived. Your fairy godmother has arrived. Now, if you got an email like that, you would think it was spam, wouldn't you? Your fairy godmother has arrived, you know, you're gonna open it up, it's gonna be Russian girls are waiting for you. You know? Hi, I'm the, king of, I'm the king of Nairobi, I have money for you, give me your credit card number, you know? <laughs> you know, I mean, just right, you think it's going to be spam, but it was actually an email from a vice president of marketing and publicity for Random House. She was in a career transition and she, of herself, and she was searching around, and she somehow found my self-published book. And she wrote to me and said, this is the best book I have ever read on finding your calling and on finding your dream. I love this book. I want to get it to a major New York publisher which for me was like saying, I want to help you meet God, you know, like really seriously, you know, of, um, and she did. She got it to the publisher I'd always dreamed of. It was torture, part of Penguin, part of Random House, whatever. She got it to the president of the company and they bought the book. And they bought it exactly the way that it was. They kept the exact writing, which is, as an unknown author, never happens. Um, I had to edit maybe 10 sentences out of the entire book. Uh, they kept the exact title. I had designed it in purple print because I didn't know what I was doing. You know, it's purple. I like purple. So they kept the purple, you know. Um, <laughs> But my point in this is you can't plan an inspired life. How can you plan that? How could I plan, I'm gonna have a meltdown for 12 years and doubt myself. Some other woman's gonna be melting her down at the end of 12 years doubting herself. We're gonna hook up. And that is my business plan. <laughs> That's what I had going for me, right? Like what bank is gonna go, yeah, that sounds good to us, Ms. Keeves. We'll sign off on that, right? <laughs> But we all have this inspired plan within us. We all have an inspired genius within us, but, we, but it's about listening. It's about the courage to do that. So I always used to tell this story, and I always used to end my talk with that story because it's such a great story. It's a, it's a great miracle. But I want to talk a little bit more about thriving through uncertainty. Because a lot of times we think, oh, if I just got the book deal. Oh, if I just got a check. 
Oh, if I just got that job. Oh, if I could just find the love of my life. Oh, if I could just get this love of my life out of my home. Uh, <laughs> you know, if I just got a di different diagnosis, right? We all do this. We think, we think over there it's going to be okay, and over there it's going to be okay. I want to talk to you about thriving through uncertainty, because life is uncertain, right? And a spiritual life is about thriving here and now, not later, not someday, not when, and not if. Right? So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, something that had come up for me when my second book was coming out. My second book is called Inspired and Unstoppable. And before it came out, I had made all these plans of this time I'm going to make up for everything I've ever done wrong in my life. You ever get that? Like where you think, like, okay, I'm going to get it right this time. This time I'm going to nail it, right? So I'm planning all these plans. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a perfect book launch and I'm going to do a perfect this and a perfect that. So it's right before the book comes out. Everything goes wrong. Everything starts falling apart. Everything goes wrong. You know, the assistant I had doesn't work out. My partner got really, really ill. And so that, that was something we were dealing with. And so we were starting to miss deadlines and opportunities and not keeping up with stuff. And everything was just getting out of control. And I was feeling worse and worse and worse. And, you know, getting scared and panicked. The date's coming. And, like, inside I'm like, <laughs> you know, which is very, very attractive. Very. <laughs> just really attractive energy in a self-help author, right? In a self-help author who's just written a book called Inspired and Unstoppable. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so one of my friends seeing this said, okay, honey, you are crazy right now. You need to get help. And so she told me, you need to go see this healer. Right? And so, like, you know when you're crazy, you'll just do anything, right? Um, and so, um, I went to see this healer, and uh, I'm driving up, to, I'm driving up to, um, to the mountains to see the healer or whatever, and driving and driving to the mountains where she lives, and she's in a yurt. Okay, she's in a yurt, all right? I, I didn't know what a yurt was. A yurt is um, a, a, a round tent. Right, and so uh, I'm from New York City. I'm like, okay, she's in a yurt, um, and so I walk in, and she's in a very soft, healing voice. Right, she's in a very soft, healing voice, and she's like, "What would you like to shift? What would you like to change? Is there anything you'd want to do differently?" Um, I'm from, you know, I'm crazy at this point, and I'm from New York. I'm like, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and she's probably thinking, "Oh my God, there is not enough sage on the planet." <laughs> to cleanse this space. Like, oh my God, I am so gonna have to move now. Like, oh my God, this is over, right? And so, <laughs> and so she says, okay, fine, that's it. We're gonna go do a ritual, right? And so she has me stand in the middle of this stream that she has on her property. She has a stream. And she has me turn this way in the stream and the water's rushing and rushing and rushing down. And she says, those are all the opportunities you've missed. You know, those are all the things that are rushing by and rushing by. Yeah, my reaction was the same as yours. I'm like, this is helpful. I'm, I am like paying money for this, you know? <laughs> but they're rushing by and she's like, oh, and that million dollar idea you had, like, oh my God, somebody else got it down. They're making two million. I'm like, what? You know? And so all the things you should have done and could have done and they're rushing by. And she asks me, how are you feeling right now? And I'm like, I'm like well, like I should investigate my healers better. Um, but um, I felt like out of control, like it was all out of control, like everything was out of control. And then I finally got it. It was out of control. It was out of my control, you know? And I just like finally got it. Like, oh my God, my life was out of my control at that moment. And I was doing the best I could. I was doing all I could do in that moment. And it was this incredible moment of self-forgiveness of just realizing, you know what? All I was doing was what I could do, right? And then she had me turn and face the stream this way. And the water was rushing and rushing and rushing at me. And she said, this is life. It's giving you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. More gifts and more people and more chances, more and more chances. And so it was just this amazing moment of realizing that I'd been spending so much time looking at what I should have done and could have done and would have done that I wasn't available to what the universe was giving and giving and giving. And I think in a spiritual life, that's our work, right? Because, you know, it's true that the past 
does not create the future. The past doesn't create the future. The present creates the future. And so in the present, what happens is sometimes we got disappointed. We got something happened or we got disappointed or life didn't turn out the way we thought it would. And we, we get disappointed and we kind of give up. We kind of shut our hearts. We kind of get disappointed and we think it's always going to be this way. It's never going to work out. And we get disappointed and we're not seeing what's coming and coming and coming. And for me, what a spiritual life is, can we choose again? Can we choose in this moment? Can we begin again? Can we dare? Right? Because, again, that's what, that's what this is about, is will we allow ourselves to believe? So I'm hoping that as a community, that's something we can do today, that we can choose again, that wherever you've been tempted to give up or not believe in something, that maybe it's a chance to say, I'm open to spirit again. I'm open because life continues to give and continues to give and continues to give. I have, analog I have an analogy in my new book, Thriving Through Uncertainty, about a video game. And it's because sometimes, you know how like you're dealing with something and like you, or you thought you dealt with it and the same thing comes back, the same issue, you ever have that? And you think, have I not seen enough therapists about this one issue? Like my God, have I not killed enough trees journaling about this one issue? But I think that life is life a video game or a spiritual life is like a video game where you've succeeded on some level, you've shown up on some level, you made it work on some level, and then you go to the next level. And at the next level, it's a little harder. At the next level, the enemies have shifted now. The rules have changed. The landscape's different. It doesn't work the way you thought it worked because you're at the next level. You're not failing, you're not falling behind, you're at the next level. And the game is, I think, Spirit's game is, can you believe me now? Can you trust me here? Can you choose love instead of fear now? That's the next level. And I really believe that's where, we're all, where we all are and where we're going, right? So um, I want to read you something from Thriving Through Uncertainty. I use a quote from A Course in Miracles in it. I teach A Course in Miracles. And uh, A Course in Miracles has this quote that says, who you think you are is a belief to be undone. Who you think you are is a belief to be undone. Meaning the part of you that thinks you're limited the part of you that thinks you're too old, the part of you that thinks you're too broken, the part of you that thinks it, you should have done this or could have done that or what, who you think you are is a belief to be undone because we're awakening to something else. So I wanna, I wanna read this to you. Um, I always think I can do it without my glasses, but who, who I, oh, my vanity is a belief to be undone. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> um, okay. A Course in Miracles teaches that who you think you are is a belief to be undone. You think you can be stopped. You think you can be diminished. You think you can fail. But that's the game. You can never lose. You already have everything you need. You have this crazy alchemical love within you, and it's yours to give in any situation, which changes every situation, and even changes you as you give it. You do not walk alone. Will you choose to listen to the disconnected smallest version of yourself or the highest allegiance of your spirit? You have a choice. Choose love. Choose again. Choose now. Ding, ding, ding. We have a winner. <laughs> so, thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. I want to... I want to end it with one of my favorite quotes. It's attributed to Jesus from the Gnostics. And it says, If you bring forth that which is within you, that which is within you will save you. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, that which is within you will destroy you. It's a little gift of guilt. <laughs> From my people to yours. <laughs> Thank you so, so much.